Hello, everyone. Hello, and welcome to the Creative Confidence Podcast. Good morning, Keith. Hello there. Hello. Hello, people. So hello, I'm Colita Stafford, partner at IDEO, and we have conversations with special guests on creativity, leadership, and innovation. As you're joining, please call, please share in the chat where you're calling in from. I see a lot of folks. We say, hello, Marcelo from Brazil, Toronto, Wisconsin. Germany. Welcome, welcome. All around the globe. So Paris, bonjour, Bermuda. Look at you. South Africa. Wow. This is really pretty impressive. Isn't this Chicago, funny? Ottawa. Hello, Turkey. So Washington, clearly DC, we Spain, have a Minnesota. Global... Uh, that'd be my that'd be my home state. <laughs> So clearly yeah. we have a global audience and I'm so thrilled that all of you are here. You are in for a real treat. Today, we are gonna be talking about how to find your creative energy and create a practice that nurtures and inspires yourself, your teams and your culture. I am thrilled to welcome Keith Yamashita. Keith, nearly 30 years ago, founded SY Partners, which is a transformation and leadership firm. About seven years ago, he founded the Q Collective, which had about 3000 professionals aims to harness creativity and propel the economy and society forward. Very, very small ambitions. Yes, Keith? <laughs> Modest. Trying to be humble people doing a good job. Uh, so Keith, as, as to welcome you, how about you share a story of something that recently sparked joy for you? You know, my, my husband and I put our firstborn into college last week and, um, she is this terrific, amazing human. Of course, we all think this about our daughters, uh, but she decided to go to school in France, a, a country in which she speaks none of the language. And so she's made this huge leap to go away to college in the country she doesn't, she doesn't even speak the language and it is heartfelt and courageous and creative and and a little bit here and uh, if I talk a little bit more I'll start weeping so like we'll 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 stay slightly shy of that um but it but it's so emblematic of our times you know I I think this is a tender important meaningful time for so many of us where we're just on that edge of sadness but yet there's a lot of possibility so you know we can dig into all of that today what a beautiful story. Thank you, Keith. What a bold mm. move for her. I'm, that's so. Uh, she's that, she's like courage times a thousand. And she's, and she's stellar. That speaks well of you, Keith. So you mm. all, listeners, you just got a glimpse of, of what Keith is magical about. So Keith, you've been on our podcast before. And, and what I, each time I get a chance to interact with you, I, I realize you unveil something about life that I didn't mm. even know I needed. Oh, and for all of you, you listening today, you are in for a real treat. Uh, mm. And I'll tell you why in just a moment. But first, let me tell you a little bit more about Keith. So he's dedicated to using creativity as a powerful catalyst for change in the world. The past three decades, he has worked with leaders at Apple, eBay, Emerson Collective, IBM. It goes on and on. The Oprah Winfrey Network, Nike, and Starbucks. And I share this because I think it's, it's valuable to understand that, Keith, you are both a creative leader and you're very much a business leader. You, you work in both those worlds. You are an author and essayist on leadership and design. Uh, and you've done some interesting, powerful creative endeavors, such as during in response to the 2020 global pandemic, mm. you hosted a series of online gatherings called The Human Moment, which really brought people together to, to both sit in the, in, the, in the polar, the dichotomy of both grief and this idea that this is, could be a time of renewal and creative energy. Uh, you are also an instructor at IDOU in our superpowers, which teaches people how to uh, activate greatness in yourself and your teams. And I already have some folks who are very excited about this conversation. So let's get to it. Emma, let's get to it. it right? <laughs> we're going to talk yes. about uh, two Thank things, you, finding your creative energy and why it's so valuable, and then tactical ways for how you can replenish it in yourself, in a duo with a pair, and in a team. And of course, we'll end with questions. So let's get started. Keith, Absolutely. what on earth do you mean? What do we mean when we're talking about creative energy? What's your definition? Yeah, yeah Why it's, are you it's drawn kind of to it. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. You're calling that I'm a creative leader and a business leader. And I really think in the real world, it's synonymous, ideally, right? So if you're out there today and you think of yourself as, oh, I lead a, a business or a team or I'm in business. And I want to be more creative or you're a creative human being 
and you want to be more successful in business, one thing I find is put them together. Because when you do, creative energy then becomes your ability as a human being to look at the situation in front of you from a new angle and to bring the energy, the perspective, the creativity, the new ideas to advance that to a better state. You know, so creative energy to me is this ability to look at the world fresh through fresh eyes and create create something new or create something better and create a new fusion of things. You and know, it's, why, um, yeah, please. Why is that important right now? Would you well, say? you know, I, I think it's interesting as we, as we've gone through the pandemic, once we got through the initial shock of the pandemic, I think um, because of great uncertainty, human nature is to lock down, to tense up, to manage more tightly with a lot more control. And because what the I really ambiguity f- is, is expansive. Ambiguity, it's a, and it's a normal human behavior. And also, and I don't know if this rings true for you, we're facing so many things we haven't faced before. There are things that need to be defined in new ways. The ways we used to do things don't work anymore. Um, the market dynamic is very different. And so actually you want access to expansiveness mm-hmm. and reflection and and a possibility. And so if if you're all clamped down like this, you can't have access to it. So the thing that allows this to happen is creative energy. It's drawing from somewhere that inspires you, lifts you, nurtures you, uplifts you to be able to do something, um, you know, better. And, 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 you know, every company, every business, every organization, every not-for-profit is different, but just be sold for a moment, be honest with yourself for a moment, do you think your problems are rote? If the problems are rote, you can deal with control. If the mm. problems and opportunities are different, new, challenging, unseen, a rare combination, then you need creativity. So perhaps not everyone needs creativity, but I would say most people need creative energy. I love it. So is this about energy within you as a person? Is well, you know, it's, we're it's talking inter- about? Yeah, I mean, we have a shared colleague, Paul Bennett. You know, we all uh-huh. adore Paul. Paul's a senior leader at IDEO. And Paul once told me, Keith, you know, we are not in the management business as leaders. We are in the energy business. And what I came to understand what Paul means is any situation, the energy we bring, the energy we unleash is really what makes the difference, you know. And and so creative energy is off, often, and we'll talk about this today, from within. Like, where do you draw inspiration? What are your rituals? How do you replenish that energy? Um, what are the pragmatic things you do every day with your schedule, what you look at, how you file ideas? We'll get into all of that. But I also think that creative energy is with what I call pairs of people or duos. Okay. And duos are, you know, you and I are a duo right now. Um, duos is the place where trust is built. Do you know? I will often say duos is the atomic unit of trust, and so there's creative energy within this. How we go into the world, how we um, no two individuals are the same. So how we co-sense, how we co-invent, how we co-imagine. I guess it's It's lovely that your name is Co. (laughs) I'm not considered that Co. You're the perfect duo. Um, But it also is within teams and Mm -hmm. and you know it when you walk into a Zoom Mm -hmm. session or you walk into a physical office, if you're lucky enough to have one and you're with a team, you can sense the energy of that team. Teams that have creative energy share ideas openly. They debate well. They pursue things that are contrarian. They know to break the status quo. They know how to jointly confront fear together. Those teams have great creative energy. Yeah. In contrast, you know, when there isn't creative energy, you yeah. know, you, there are times where you're like, I cannot wait to get off the Zoom. You just want to click that red button and, 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 and that's when you know there isn't creative energy. You know? Obviously, so these things are related, please. Yeah. So I, I love, so you've, so we were going to talk about three different ways you can replenish yes. or think about creative energy, an individual, yes. in a duo, and a team. Let's say on the team, and I have a question for our audience. Um, sure. I'm going to put up a poll. And I'm curious, I want you all to think of a group of people you've worked with in the past week or month. Um, where is your team on the spectrum of creative energy? Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts. So that poll should be up. We'll leave it up for a minute. And Keith, while people are thinking about that, can you give us some guidance on how do you know if your team is low on creative energy? What does it look well, you like? Know, it- 
it's it's both a quantitative thing and qualitative thing. So on the quantitative side, you keep missing deadlines. You can't fulfill your objectives. Um, you can't mm. think of strategies in new ways. Um, people often are not on time to meetings. They don't have the endurance to do work. So there's a lot of quantitative things, but okay. there's also quali- qualitative things. You know, you um, feel exhausted. The team feels like they're at war. You feel what I call perpetually bland. You know, you 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 log on and you're like, this just does not interest me. Um, unable to move forward, stuck in position. So the, the quantitative side is largely about outcomes yeah but we have to realize that the outcomes from the qualitative side how does it feel yeah you know I, I, I just tried to vote on the poll and it says panelists cannot vote um well, but you i would say, say it loud where are you <laughs> and here we are i you know to me i think i mean i get to work with a lot of different teams but i'd say most of the teams that i'm on are in this phase of rebuilding their creative energy that mm-hmm. that so many of us have been depleted me included over the last two and a half, three years. And we're trying to find new ritual and new way and new paths to replenish energy. And um, it's if you want to be a good professional, I think it's actually a responsibility uh, mm. to replenish your energy. Mm. It's We often think of capital as a resource and it's vital and it's important, um, but creative energy is also a resource. It's a vital input. So we're going to you know, get we, really... Let's yeah, let's please. see what the let's see what the results say and let's yes. get tactical. Because Keith, I will admit, when I am with a creative team and it feels depleted, I do have a default where I go into like trying to be more efficient or even more structured. And you're actually inviting me to think of a different response to that. Yeah, I you know I, I I'm not against structure and I'm not against prioritization and I'm not against um, efficiency. I think all of those things are important, but they're insufficient. So if I look mm. at these poll results, Let's look, yeah. So we have when you're when you're really depleted, which eight percent of us on this are, um, when you when you only focus on efficiency, there's no new energy coming into the system. Mm. So when you come to generate an idea, when you're depleted and there's no new stimulus, you can only come up, you only reach in the bag of ideas and you pull out the same ideas that you've had before. And then when you're truly depleted, depleted, sometimes you don't have enough energy to reach in the bag. You know, losing our mojo. So, you know, 18% of us here losing our mojo, meaning we feel like our energy is waning. You know, so that often I find you need to work more in duos rather than mm. solo. You know, you really need to have an accountability buddy for your creative energy. We'll talk about that more today. You yeah, know, listen. hanging on, hanging on. I, I often say to people who are hanging on, it's um, you got to move from victim of the situation to, um, you know, investor in your own future performance. And you have to make the decision that you want to renew your creative energy. You've got to manage your calendar differently. You've got to start your day differently. Those of us who are rebuilding our creative energy, I think that's about turning it from notion to ritual. It's um, how you do something every morning, how you start out every meeting. I, I work with a team uh, in the not-for-profit space, and they have a phrase that they started using in the pandemic, which is start with poetry. Mm. And um, this sounds absolutely decadent, right? So if, if you're it, sitting it, out there, you're like, oh, we have a 60-minute you know, meeting. How are we going to start with poetry? Every meeting, they'd start with one person reading a poem, and they see where that poem takes them. Sometimes takes three minutes, sometimes five minutes. It puts people into their human space and opens up their full capacities, Uh, not just their analytic capacities. mm -hmm. Now, I'm not suggesting that every team, you know, if you're sitting in a very hardcore bank, this may not be a practice that is culturally acceptable in your bank. Um, And I'm not trying to stereotype. So if you're in your bank and you're like, I don't know, Keith, you don't get my bank. No, my point being, it's not always culturally appropriate to do that, but what is your ritual that starts every meeting that brings energy into the room, that releases full creativity of people, that invites people in rather than punishes people with an agenda no one wants to do? Um, you know, so anyway, so and, and if you're one of these people who's highly energized, um, 
you know, you are in a rare position to be able to share that gift with others. So if your home team, your base team is highly energized, there are other teams in your life that are not. You are the thing that that will allow people to build their well. Uh, And the poll is now done, I see. So I probably chewed chewed up too much time in my explanation, but I'm just trying to root it in where people actually are. And by the way, uh, we have someone who works at a bank and they said, poetry sounds awesome. <laughs> so uh, call me for recommendations. Uh, we the, also- <laughs> the poet, the poet, David White, W-H-Y-T-E, best poet for business environment that I've ever encountered. He, he is all about how to harness create, creative energy and to appear to face the things that you need to face in business. That's wonderful. We have another person who commented and said, you know, our team now starts with virtues, which at first I thought was woo-woo, but it works. It unlocks a different type of behavior and mindset. So Keith, you started to give some very specific examples of what one might do. I'd like to go through, let's, let's really ground this so people can start to practice some things. Let's start with at the individual level. What, yeah. are some, what, are some, what, are some, what are some ways that you guide people to think about how they might replenish their creative energy at an individual level? What is something you yeah. do? Yeah, so so a couple of things. One thing, um, and uh, we will put this out to you um, in the next couple of weeks here. Uh, every time I do a, a, a interaction or talk, I do a little mind map. So if I turn to this mind map for me, you know, um, in order to have creative energy in a group, you first have to have creative energy for yourself. You know, maybe that's a fancy way of, you know, put the uh, oxygen on first before you help mm-hmm. others. Um, let me start with a couple. So a couple okay. of pragmatic things. Um, and often when we talk about creativity, we think of creativity as a spontaneous act. And I actually don't experience creativity that way. I experience creativity as the perpetual taking in of the world with a careful eye where you slow the world down to look for inspirations, something new, something you haven't seen before. And so step one of replenishing your creative energy is bringing attention Mm. to the path you travel every day. Uh, You don't actually have to go out of your path necessarily, meaning the slogan you see on the wall, the beautiful thing you see in nature, the thing that your kid says to you when you're running late and you really have to pause to hear. And my my trick here is you have to develop a rigorous ritual Mm of storing those ideas. Mm. So what do you mean? What so mean? I have, I mean, very basic things like in your house, have, an, have a board where you find things that are interesting and in, in diagrams and things you read, tack them up on the wall right, right in front of your computer. Mm. Um, have in your uh, backpack, a special folder in which you only put inspirations. Mm. Um, have a place on your desk where you pile up the books that are inspiring books that are right in front of you and make a ritual of reading them when you wake up. Um, so, so it's um, Instagram, you know, where so many of us are on social media. Like I really file the inspirations as they come in, in categories. The, the point here is not to adopt any one of those practices that I have. The practice of, for you is the observation and the storing of inspiration mm. because creative energy comes from knowing you have an, virtually infinite source to draw upon. And when you have these things tucked away, filed, put here in a stack, it gives you the self-confidence to always bring an inspiration to the moment. Nice. Second thing. Great. Yeah. Second second Please. thing is what do you do first in your day? What do you do at last in your day? And you know, <laughs> most of us have a ritual of phone first mm-hmm. and phone last in the day. And I actually, not that I'm anti-phone, you know, Apple's a beautiful company, uh, iPhone 14, get one. Um, but I I try to start the day and end the day with something that's very expansive. So during mm. the pandemic, I started a ritual, something I called poem scraps, which was the first thing I do, I wake up, sit down, have some tea, and I write part of a poem. And the point is actually not a not to write the poem. It's not a that sounds like a hard bar, a uh, high bar. No, 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 no. It's yeah, yeah. it's pick a fra- pick a phrase, pick something, notice something, and what it does is it puts me in a noticing mode. It puts me in a uh, present and grounded mode. 
so much better than waking up and doing yeah. email on my phone, tapping with my my um, my fingers. You know, same thing. How do you end the day? You know, yeah. many of us have a gratitude practice at the end of the day. What do you do that actually nourishes your creativity? Um, all these things, you know, Rasha, what a great point. You know, expansive thinking. You know, what you're trying to do here is liberate your own creativity. Creativity is already in you. What you're trying to do is stimulate it. So you're trying to give it a place to be nourished. That's the inbound. That's the filing. That's the rituals so that you can get that creativity in the into the world, which is in conversation, in meetings, you know, in sessions, in work sessions. Um, we have some great questions coming in. I know you're looking at them. Wake up Keith. earlier. I am. Um, I'm a morning so, person. I know some of you, my husband is not a morning person. He does not get up till 930. So he will hate this when I say this. But if you wake up a little bit earlier to create that time of peace for yourself in the morning, it puts you in a creative mode so that once you start interacting with your peers, you're in a much better psychological space. That is helpful. But does it have to be that big? Like it's not a, do you, these don't have to be huge moments. Like some people are very busy. They have busy kids lives. Is this, is this, I, I, is this a actually, big adoption you know i think I, I think that these micro actions mm. these micro choices uh compounded make you know so if, if you for me if you do palm scraps that means i have 365 palm scraps from which real real palms can be made and i'm not saying you should be a poet i'm saying what is your thing whether it's write down your dreams that you had the night before, whether it's read something good for you, whether it's ignore the news and going yeah, into something I that's see. more soulful, whether it's take a photo every morning, it's what is your micro practice that gets your day started on the right thing? Because these micro behaviors become cumulative. They become a way of yeah. working. I, I talk a lot about um, when, when you become like really good at this practice, you start to really curate your mind diet and your heart diet, you know, what are the things that nourish how you're feeling about the world, how you feel about other people, uh, you know, a heart diet can include the time you spend with your family, um, the time in deep conversation versus just one-on-one, -on -one, you know, to-do list trading, um, you know, your, your, your mind diet is what is the richness of ideas that you're feeding your mind Wonderful. that allow you to explore. Um, and, it's such and, an, accessible invitation your mind diet and your heart diet so yeah and yeah please you know well well i want to we talked a lot about the individual you've got some great yeah. ideas let's let's talk about duos what does it mean to have a creative practice with another person and and yeah what are some ways that you practice that you know, so one one thing we should talk about is what deletes depletes creative energy. So a very confusing world where we're getting constantly negative messages, where we're always on high alert, where we're always scanning the horizon for something that's going to defeat us, uh, you know, hold us back, crumble the world around us. That that depletes creative energy. You know, it destroys creative energy. So what a duo does is create the trust and safety to rebuild that energy. You know, so one thing great creative duos attempt is what I say there. We permit each other to ask a more beautiful question. So not mm. just mm. what happened today, but what mattered to you today. Not just, ooh, how do we get out of this predicament? But what is the narrative that is shaping how I'm dealing with this predicament? And is that story really serving me? Um, what if does that mean? You have, Ask yeah. a more beautiful question. Well, you're, you know, in you're, business. You're doing it right now. What does that mean? Well, in, in business, we tend to ask yes or no questions. And then we tend to get yes or no responses. Or we tend to ask only concrete questions. Um, so as an example, did we or did we not hit the goal? We did not hit the goal. Okay. Second question, who is at fault? Okay. Michael is at fault. Um, these questions about blame placing um, don't really get at the fodder for creativity. Ask and said, um, what is our pattern that you think prevented us from succeeding? 
And it opens a more expansive way of understanding yeah. and looking at it. I see. Yeah. If you, if you were to say, I know Michael had a really rough time. In what way would we support Michael so next time he could claim the victory? What did I do today that unintentionally defeated us from achieving what we set out to do? Um, what do you see in your part of the world that I don't see? Yeah. These are what I call a slightly more beautiful question. Again, the so poet David you... White has a whole thing about this. You should study David White's yeah. work. He's spectacular on this point, which is we it's cannot wonderful. solve a problem unless we're willing to ask a question about it. So beautiful questions return beautiful answers. Beautiful answers expand your creative practice. So one thing that happens in a duo is um, think about this. Go through your calendar today. If you were to go through your whole week, or actually we're almost at the end of the week, right? So um, how many of the conversations have been set up as beautiful questions? Mm. How many of your interactions, your one-on-one -on -one duo interactions have been energy giving? Mm. How many of these have you spent doing a task I called co-sensing, which is... Um, the world's super confusing. And the only way that you return your kind of energy is you have to compare what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. And in that co-sensing, you learn something not just about each other, um, but about the world and the world that you're trying to shape and trying to operate in. So um, make that appointment to go co-sensing, um, you know, get on your call, put on your headphones, go on a 60 minute walk. Your other person is on a 60 minute walk in their city. And spend that time co-sensing, not just barking commands, not just doing to-dos, not just doing follow-ups. All those things are important, but they're insufficient. Um, yeah. Yeah. I know of I I I know of one colleague who would look through their calendar and assess what were the energy nourishing or the energy depleting meetings throughout the week and and curate or or curtail based on that. Absolutely. So, you know, you you create um I call these my sacred, uh, my sacred ceremonies. You know, I have a leader, Deb Bub. She's a very senior leader um, in healthcare in the HR field. And um, Deb and I pursue topics together. So we, we have an open talk topic about equity in business. We have an open talk topic about beauty within business. We have an open topic of humanity within business. And what Deb and I do is we trade books when we find things, we, we clip things and send each other things, we text each other things, and then we make time pretty religiously Hmm. Uh, to do a long walk when we're in each other's cities. I, I remember, you know, one time walking from Southern Manhattan all the way up the West side to, to almost 42nd street with Deb as we pursue these topics. That's a, and if that's you a have, long walk. It's a long walk, but if you have an accountability buddy um, in these topics about creativity, you, you progress better and you also create a human bond. Now you may be sitting there and saying, who on earth has time to work from Southern Manhattan, to walk from Southern Manhattan to 42nd Street? You have to be crazy. And what I would love for you to do is look at the math of wasted time, frustrated time, time you spend behind closed doors, the things you're texting in the back channel on a Zoom meeting, the emails that you send your colleagues where you're rolling your eyes as you're writing them. And by the way, these are not wicked tasks. These are all human responses. Add all of that time up dedicate yeah. that to the walk instead of all those other behaviors because what allows you to route around these behaviors is the creativity and human capacity to invent a different way of doing things so you know skeptics and there are a lot of skeptics on this call it's normal um I just do the math do yeah. the math on the negative energy that is in your business day and you'll find you probably have a couple hours every week that you could dedicate to nourishing your creativity. This is fascinating. And I mean, Keith, you, you embody it. You, you have such a well, like we can see Try from you be. because of Try your practice. Be. Yeah. So I really do want to hear, and others want to know teams. So I get individual, yeah. I can do that. A duo, a trust. I could, I could probably find that. Teams feels like a much bigger arena and kind of challenge. How do you think about teams you know teams have the aggregate of individuals who have a creative energy practice and they are the aggregate of duos who have a trust bond and who have accountability to each other for creativity so the way to break down in a team is 
do your individual work, do your duo work, and you bring all of that into the team, it gives the team a much better starting point. You know, I was, I was, um, I, um, I have very lucky to work with a firm called Godfrey Dadich Partners. They're a design firm that's dedicated to something called the new editorial, basically how to tell your story as a company uh, with the sanctity and truth telling of the best journalism. And I was been doing a body of work with these leaders because um, they're in the creativity business. I mean, they get paid to be creative. Hmm. And one of the things you can do as the team is to really get into whole human desires of the team. And we did an exercise where we said, what is a great life? What is great work? And what is great impact? And we had everyone do their paragraphs, mind maps, collages. They're a very creative group. And then we had everyone share that output. We had a almost a half-day session to do so. Again, you may be sitting there like, well, why does it matter? Well, when you know everyone's definition of a full, rich life, when you have an understanding of what great work means, and you have an understanding of the difference people want to make in the world, and that becomes your lingua franca, that becomes the way you then treat each other, invite each other, work with each other, make decisions, that um, draws out people's creativity because they realize, yes, there are a bunch of tasks at play, but what we're really doing is building a great life. What we're really doing is building great work. What we're really doing excuse me, is building great impact. And when it when we engage with each other in that context, it's the same task, but when we engage with each other in that context, we find meaning and meaning helps draw out people's creativity. I will lend my heart to this because it's important. I will lend my heart to this because it's not just about the task. I will lend my imagination to this because it's worth it. I will help that person because I may not love the task they're asking me to do, but I definitely believe in the impact they're trying to make in the world. So, you know, again, just start by writing down your own definition. Do it with yeah. two of you. Do yeah. it with your direct report and have the conversation. What's interesting is that all the task conversations that come after, you can reroute them to the base of what matters to people. You know, so it may sound very highfalutin, but then it ends up all of your one-on-ones become more productive. All of the things mm-hmm. that you achieve for projects become more valuable of why to do it. Conversely, things that are tasks that are just big old wastes of time, their make work, fall off the table because people are like, that's not about a great life. That's not about great work. That's not about, you know, a great impact. It has, it has no material difference in the world, no emotional difference in the world. Why do we do this? You know, so it's, you know, and, you know, we have lots of other things on this. We'll share, we'll share, Share. we'll definitely share the mind map follow-up. Yeah. So Keith, I am going to build on this because, and we're going to, we're going to go into questions now because we have a lot of great ones. So you just gave an example of a, of a team where they were creative. They were open to this. It unlocked even more capacity. So we have a few questions where people struggle with that in their environment. So for example, um, Amy is talking about what if I work in an environment that doesn't invite creativity and honestly isn't even interested? Or we have another question in the, in the realm of my in my organization, there's not enough creative place for me to put my best expansive self into the world. Do you have yeah. how do you guide people when the conditions in their in their context yeah, so do not be, lend themselves? It, it, So Amy, the first question I would ask is, do you, you know, if there were a mini Amy on your shoulder and said, Amy, is this organization in your best interest long-term? What's the answer you'd give? So, because it matters. So if if little Amy on your shoulder says, Amy, this place is killing you inside, there is never going to be opportunity for creativity, then my answer to you would be, let's do everything we can to help you find a better place to be. Um, because you cannot be a creative soul in an environment that is soul crushing, where there is no opportunity to be creative. If little Amy says, well, no, it's just, we're going through a tough time. Like it's not always going to be like this. Then I think you start very small. You try to create your own environment, you and one other colleague, you and one other buddy, you and one other teammate. You try to start very small, and see if you can create the sanctity of creativity where you yourself are comfortable with your creative practice. Once you have that, then you can expand to your team. I would say that um, 
to the second question, Co, about being in an environment that's not very open to creativity, you, you, priming um, has an awful lot to do with whether we're willing to bring creative energy. So one thing you can work on is to say, rather, there's no creative place, there's no creative place. Constantly go through your day to say, where is somewhere where I can insert creativity? So rather than look at the mm. lack of creativity, mm. look for opportunities to apply. Because the priming, it's quite weird. The priming means like, you know, so give you an example. The Godfrey Dadich example of um, great life, great work, great impact came after a very big conflict in their leadership team. They had an incident that was a, a major conflict. So this did not come from la di da you know, flowers and roses. This came from a really dark moment on the team. I was looking for a way coming out of the pandemic to help that team tap into their creative energy. I used that moment to present the idea. So do your framing, your, uh, you know, um, you're looking for it, you know, when a meeting falls apart. Often that awkward 30 seconds on Zoom after, that's a minute where you uh -huh. can insert creativity. You failed, that's a moment. Um, everyone is in a shitty, bad mood. That's a moment. Ask a beautiful question, turn the meeting and make it a generative moment. If you're looking for the opportunities, you will find them. I mean, that's what's lovely about this era of things being kind of wicked difficult is there is almost an infinite number of places you can apply this creative energy. That's so helpful and so accessible. So let's take, there's a, a similar question, but at the other end of the spectrum. So this is, this is, um, how might you grow more of your creative confidence? So Ned asked a question. Yes. What if you are full of energy and creativity and you have a fear of coming forth or even in the first question, like you, you have it and you want to put it out there, but um, you might not have the courage or you might yes. not. Um, yeah. There's a fear. How do you? Yeah. Uh, um, you know, I've been uh, really advocating for the poet, David White. And one of the reasons mm -hmm that I love David's work is he talks about disappearances as human beings. When we feel not capable or not able, uh, we tend to disappear, right? We go off camera, we quiet ourselves, we shrink back, we don't respond to the email, we don't pick up the call. And, and David says, you know, um, these disappearances are very natural and very normal. Mm. Leadership, is about becoming comfortable with always being present to not allow ourselves to disappear and to stand in the nakedness of that moment of, I might not know, I might make a mistake, I might not have everything I need, but I'm gonna stick with it and be present. So Ned, I think that the trick in this is upping your capacity to stay present upping your capacity to put the idea out there, upping your capacity to sit with the meeting in all of its awkwardness and not turn off your camera. And that is what leadership is. And what I have found in studying and trying myself to practice this is when you hold your ground on presence, it invites others to do the same mm -hmm. thing. And when you have a team that's fully present, is when you can do your most daring creative work because something frightening comes your way. You don't shriek, you hold your ground. The yes. project fails, the prototype fails, you hold your ground. That creative confidence is really just about the confidence to be fully present as a human being. Then we, I'll add one more thing. Magdalena just wants yeah. to plus one that this is so simple yet profound, great advice. The ability to stay Presence. Go ahead. You were saying something, Keith. Yeah, and, and I'll just add one thing at the risk of seeming a little bit didactic. There is somewhere in your life that you are boldly and fully present. You have a sick parent. You have a tough aspect of your relationship. You have a heartache that you've endured. You've had an illness that you've contended with. You've had a neighbor who's been belligerent to you. Somewhere in your life, you have had the capacity to hold your ground as a human and declare your dignity by staying present. 
So often life seems super overwhelming. I can't do it in business. This will be embarrassing. I don't know. People don't accept it. What if they, what if they, what if they, these are all super normal. Draw on the place of your life where you have it because chances are you have endured something far bigger than putting the idea out in the meeting. Once you know you have that from some other part of your life, you can transfer it into the everyday. Um, this is so powerful, Keith. And with so much amazing wisdom, see what I mean, people, you didn't even know this is what you needed. <laughs> Keith, we have time for one more question. And okay. then I'm gonna, I have another invitation to the, to the audience. Um, this is another question around the leadership. We're going to stay in that sphere. Uh, how can you aspire a team without sounding condescending or top down? Like mm -hmm. this, like creative practices can feel in some capacity, like a privilege or a, uh, yeah. How do you strike the right tone as a leader without sounding condescending? Well, you know, I think, um, Part of its mindset. So if you think as a leader that all the creative energy comes from you, you're already down the wrong path. You know, a job of a leader is to help everyone replenish their creative energy and apply it to the opportunities and problems at hand. So one is mindset. I think the second thing is we often think about leadership as what we say, what we talk about. And obviously I'm doing a ton of talking today. Um, but the best thing about creative energy is demonstrating it through your practice. You know, I worked with an executive at IBM and he was anointed a new role and he had about three months to prepare for that role. He blocked out his Friday afternoons to do creativity sessions and was religious about it and exposed that calendar to everyone on his team. Knowing that he held the time for creativity every week encouraged other people to hold their time on every week. So I don't always know, condescending is when I'm preaching at you. If I can demonstrate a practice and then invite you into it, um, it feels like help, you know? It, does, it doesn't feel like um, trying to make you conform. It comes as a, a nurturing elixir for something you didn't know you needed. That's magnificent. And we've got some great builds on that, this idea of um, awareness. And we've got even got some um, some recommendations around how to think about uh, your presence and, and how you show up in those moments and the practice. So yes. Keith, I do, I have one last question for you in just a moment, but first I want to invite everyone listening today to set an intention for yourself. So Keith has, has given us a lot of practical ideas, some simple ways to start some more complex ones. I would love for you to move from these ideas to practice. Uh, and Keith, I know you actually want to know what what do people want to try? What is one thing you want to try this week to replenish your creative energy in yourself, your team, or a duo? And I'd love for you to share it in the chat, everyone. Uh, we saw I saw some interesting ones, Keith. Like there's someone runs a creativity gym. Love that. There's examples. Yeah. So please. So and some... Judy, this Judy, this is being recorded and will be made available to this community as well. So we've got some folks who want to try some poem scraps, read a book on the topic, replacing Paint. negativity with beautiful questions. Yeah, many of you are trying to build a hands-on practice. And I think one way that you build creativity is you get out of only your head. So whether mm -hmm. that's painting, sketching, drawing, writing, hiking, um, you know, become more embodied in your creative press practice. That's so helpful too. I loved, I, I keep going back to, to the mind diet and heart diet. That's one I want to yes. work on Keith. Mm -hmm. Morning pages, yeah. identifying where your energy goes during the day. That's a great place to start. You know, it's, um, I did this practice where I was um, looking at time sucks was the way I would end my day is like, where did all the negative energy go? And then you actually set up your next day differently based on what, what happened. So Keith, These are all got, really great. We've got hundreds of folks getting ready to shift their mindset and their practice for more creative energy. And that's that. exactly what we'd hope from this. I am going to, I'm going to move us. I'm going to wrap us up. We are out of time. Uh, Keith, you're, I'm going to give you the last question. I'll give you a minute to think on it and then I'll wrap us up. Sure. Um, sure. I want you to think on what advice would you have given yourself, your younger self, or you wish you had received while you think on that. I just want to thank 
everyone for joining today. Huge thanks to uh, Keith Yamashita. Uh, we've been talking, so Keith is the founder of SY Partners. We've been talking about how to find your creative energy. If you'd like to learn more about how to lead teams to inspire creativity and collabor collaboration, I invite you to check out our certificate program, The Foundations in Creative Leadership. You can find that at idou.com slash creative leadership cert. Uh, and with that, Keith, I'd love for you to close us out. What is advice you wish you'd given your you know, I, I think self? the thing I, I think I wish my younger self knew that your inner work is far more important than your outer achievement. And if you do that inner work, that creative energy, that mindset, that at peace with the present moment, your achievement and outcomes naturally follow. Obsess on the inner work. That's so insightful. Thank you. So we've got amazing you, folks that, that filled my heart. Keith, thank you for all your wisdom. I think all of us are going to want to listen to this a couple times because there are multiple layers of insight in this in this session. Thank you for joining. Thank you all. Enjoy thank you, your thank day, you. Keith. Enjoy your Bye. day, everyone else. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.